Thanks everyone for joining and welcome to our Ranked Choice Voting Roadmap about talking to your legislators. We have a surprise guest here tonight, so I want to get to that really quickly. A representative Mia Gregerson is here to answer some questions about how you can be most effective when talking to legislators. My name is Ben Chapman. I'm the Communications Manager at Fairville, Washington. I'll be emceeing, but I'll mostly be helping other folks do the talking. Uh, a few little housekeeping things here before we start. Uh, we're going to start with a panelist discussion with Representative Gregerson and um, political advisor John Weibel, who will tell you how you can be most effective on a lobby day, whether you're writing to legislators, whatever you're doing as an advocate, their advice, I'm sure, is going to be fantastic. Um, they're super smart folks, and they've been super helpful for helping me get better at my advocacy. Then we'll be talking about where our bill is at. The Washington Voices Act has been introduced in the legislature. It's hopefully going to move forward pretty quickly here. Um, so the legislative session is moving very fast. It's a short session this year. There's a lot to keep track of. So we'll give you a briefing on what's happening there. And then a little call to action right at the end so you can actually take action with all the advice you learned today. Um, and before we hop into all that, I want to introduce Stephanie Z, uh, I'll ask Spotlight, who will be in the chat helping you get all the information you need. So Stephanie, would you like to tell folks what you're going to be dropping in the chat today? Hi guys, it's nice to virtually be with everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the organizer at Fairboat Washington. So I will be managing the chat. If you see, if you've been to other, our previous roadmaps and you see like the chat, the chat being spammed with a bunch of links, that's me in the back. Um, but if there are any links that come up for like articles, um, our bills, anything that you need to be directed to, you can check the chat for them. I will also drop a handout in the chat at the end that has, it's a living document with all of the links on it. So you don't have to worry about saving the chat. Um, and if you have any questions, please use the Q and A function. Um, that's how we receive your questions for when we're asking like our guests, uh, whatever questions that y'all have. Thank you. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, I am now going to bring up Carrie, who is going to help us uh, talk for panelists. So there you go. Hi, Carrie. I'll duck out now so you can take it away. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you again tonight. Um, as we're kicking off legislative session, I'm very excited to have two incredible political um, influencers, if you will, with us tonight. One of them is a local representative, Mia Gregerson, um, who was first appointed to represent the 33rd Legislative District, um, which includes SeaTac, Normandy Park, Des Moines, and parts of Kent, Burien, Renton, and unincorporated King County. Um, she has also served as the mayor of SeaTac City Council from 20, 2008 to 2015. And she prides herself on representing one of the most racially diverse districts in the state. Prior to her service as a state rep, um, Rep. Gren excuse me, rep, rep Gregerson worked as a surgical assistant and business manager in the dental field for nearly 20 years. I was blown away when I saw this very diverse career. Uh, we also have with us John Weibel. Um, John has over 30 years of community organizing, political consulting, and creative direction experience. He has worked for most major Democratic elected leaders here in Washington state, including Senator Cantwell, Governor Inslee, uh, Rep. Smith, and Rep. Kilmer. He's the only local creative director in Washington state to win both the Reed Award for Best Local Political Television Ad and an American Association of Political Consultants Poly Award for Best Local Direct Mail. He has run organizing programs all over the country, and we are very grateful to have him on our team. So I want to ask you both a couple of questions um, and also being mindful of Rep. Gregerson's time tonight. So Rep. Gregerson, I'm going to jump in straight to you. How do legislators decide if they're going to support a bill? Well, it all typically goes right back to their own values and, and their own experience. And so typically when someone has an idea, they will talk about it through um, why why there's a problem, what's missing, and how the bill or how a proposal will fix that, whether it's incrementally or um, in totality. So sometimes it takes several years to get a bill passed all the way to the governor's desk, but um, it certainly is a, an opportunity to organize around an issue. 
Thank you so much. And I'd love to hear from you, John, from your perspective as a political consultant, what does it take from the outside to get a legislator to support a bill? Yeah, well, you know, I agree with Representative Gregerson about the values. Um, they come with a set of lived experiences, uh, especially around elections. I mean, one of the interesting things about this particular bill is, you know, all those legislators have participated in elections and feel like, you know, they won their elections, obviously, or they wouldn't be in Olympia. So they feel like they have an understanding of, of what goes on in terms of our, our electoral process. So there, there can be folks that are excited, you know, they got elected through the status quo. So that can be a little bit of a challenge in, in this space for um, why we want to, um, you know, talk about local jurisdictions doing something a little differently and why that's important. I think that's a lot of the, the messaging here is why, um, why creating an opportunity uh, uh, through the Washington Voting Rights Act with ranked choice voting to, uh, to you know, change the way we're doing that, why that's important is going to be key. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that is a big part of the reason why we're having lobby day. It's a big part of the reason that we write emails and make phone calls and go and speak to our representatives in person. When we're there, Rep. Gregerson, how much do legislators pay attention to what their constituents say? The, the, a lot. Um, there's a lot coming at us. That's probably part of the problem is that you have lobby day and there's probably a few other groups that have a lobby day. And so you're kind of fighting for oxygen in that space. So that's where, you know, just really humanizing the policy, um, a minute to win it, again, a personal story, and not just the what, but the why, so that um, we can memorize. We can memorize not only who you are and why you came today, but then again, when we see you again, um, but also, it's always helpful to have the bill number memorized and a very distinct ask, not one that corners them, but one that just helps us to remember, oh, so you want us to send an email to the state government committee for a hearing or, you know, something like that. So a very simple ask, but also, again, humanize that, personalize it. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, John, from the political space, how much do it sometimes can feel as though we're not being heard by our legislators. So how do you put that into perspective um, from the activist side? Yeah, and I do agree that, um, you know, constituents are really important to legislators. But there are, of course, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There are interest groups and other political factors that legislators are taking into account. And um, I don't think we have to, you know, really worry about that. Um, our job, I, I think, during a lobby day is to really talk about the policy and why you as an individual are so supportive of the policy. So I would worry less about, you know, the storm of politics, though, you know, we all see it every day uh, and just really communicate a straightforward message about why this bill is important. I also think that doing just a, you know, three minutes of homework on the person you're talking to, um, knowing what committees they sit on, what their interests are. Again, if you see that they're, you know, they like dogs and you have a dog, sometimes just having that direct connection real early helps, again, provide that story so that you can then leap into um, your, your pitch. One time I got an A in a Norwegian presentation because I brought up my dogs, so... There we go. And can fully endorse this method. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rep. Gregerson, um, we got into this a little bit in the last question. You already answered some of it, but I'd love to ask it more explicitly. Um, many people here have called and emailed their legislators before. I'd love to hear from your perspective um, what happens in a legislator's office when you receive those messages and what makes it easiest for your office and staff to take note of the opinions when they come in. Yeah, we're getting a lot of emails and I, I usually get a lot anyway, but we're really getting a lot right now. But the, the system does query if you are from their legislative district and we query if it's a personal note. So a lot of times there's a stock email that's sent out um, and it will sh sh tell us if it's or show us if it's from our personal LD. But again, I always ask Tira, my legislative assistant, to please make sure you bubble up the ones that have a personal note to them. 
That is really helpful. Thank you. And when the note is being written, I'm guessing it's also helpful to include the bill number, like you mentioned before, and maybe attach a picture of your dog. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, short and sweet, um, direct message, um, friendly, um, and then ask for a response. I do find that if there's a res response request put in there, I think that it just puts, it's more than just telling us something, you're actually asking us a question to respond to. Absolutely. I'm taking notes over here. Thank you for that. Um, John, I'm not sure how much you can answer this question. So we're going to, we're going to move on. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rep. Gregerson, um, I know I want to be mindful of your time tonight. So this is my last question for you this evening. What are your favorite ways to interact with constituents or what is your favorite part of interacting with constituents? Mm -hmm. Well, I think all of us, get into this job because we really want to help people. Like that is what motivates us. And so when you feel like you're helping people or a person, um, it really feels good. And I think that's my favorite part. Um, sometimes, you know, you're helping people, you don't realize that you've helped them. And later on, they'll come back to you and they'll tell you what, what was different, what changed. And so I think, you know, for some people too, this is just the beginning of your journey of learning about who your representatives are, who your senators are. And, you know, you can let them know, like you plan to find them in districts and you want to have coffee with them during interim or something. So I, I do think that those are the fun parts of my job um, is really um, learning about people and having and making friends. Yeah. I love that. It is really just about making friends wherever we go. And that's, I think we have a really special political community in Washington. So thank you for being part of it. Thank you for helping lead us. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, for all the work you're doing. It's critically important. I promise that there's many of us that are fighting to get this bill to the governor's desk. I personally have seen a lot of changes over the last you know, four or five years is people getting more and more comfortable. I think you're on the right path. I think, you know, you're doing a great job. Also, like making it less wonky. <laughs> the last few sessions, it was really hard. It was like talking to the PDC is like 15 points to whatever the, you know, the question the answer is. So you're doing a great job. I'm really rooting for you. I'll be looking for you. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next Wednesday. That's good. Bye bye. Bye-bye, take care. All right. All right, John, it's just you and me now. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the hot seat. <laughs> in the hot seat. All right. From your perspective, as somebody who's worked very closely with legislators over the years, what does a successful meeting with a legislator look like? I think it's all about keeping the message authentic and straightforward and simple. Right. I mean, one of the great things about doing this planning is, you know, we can really think about, you know, we want all these legislators to get a very, you know, it should be tailored to the individual, but it also should be clear the message across every meeting. Um, so, you know, making that happen, if we do that, this will be incredibly successful. I love that. Thank you. And sort of on that note, we often get questions and it's, I think, a fun one to answer that sometimes our legislators are supportive of ranked choice voting, sometimes they're not, sometimes we don't know where they are with them. Um, but let's start with, if your legislator already supports ranked choice voting, um, what is the best way to go into that meeting or what is the best way to write that email? Yeah, you know, I think it starts out with the points of agreement. You know, we both see that, and, and really specific to this bill, there's a couple of things that I think are really important. I don't know how many people think politics is working perfectly right now. Um, you know, that's a lot of the impetus for a lot of this democracy reform. Can we get more people to the table? Can we involve more people? Can people feel more included in the process? Remember those values when you're in these meetings, even with folks that are supportive of ranked choice voting, right? Um, that's the first premise of why we're, we all do this work, is we feel like democracy could work better in the United States, in every county, in every state, in every city, right? Um, and then the second thing is, you know, and I'm probably jumping ahead on the folks that don't support ranked choice voting, um, they don't need to support ranked choice voting to, to support this bill. 
um, because a lot of what this is doing is setting regulations and standards. The courts have already said that we can, you know, that ranked choice voting can be a remedy for the Voting Rights Act. How are we going to do that? Is it just going to be every city up to, you know, the, their own devices, or are we going to set some guidelines and standards, you know, so that so that if a city decides to do it this way, there's an understanding of how that's going to move forward. Um, I think that's those are important messages to get across in these meetings, e even with somebody. And in fact, doing that second part with somebody that supports ranked choice voting is actually really important because they may take that to another legislator who isn't as supportive. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think we we in this activist space are trying to build up or it's something I've learned along the way is that building up your messengers, building up the people who do agree with you, who do want the same vision as you is really critical and is really helpful um, to be in a position where you, you know, your community is behind you. You know that you can move forward um, with your constituents behind you. So um, thank you so much for touching on all of that. And thank you for touching on, yeah, if your legislator doesn't like ranked choice voting, it's, that is kind of the beauty of this bill. We don't, it's not even really about ranked choice voting. This bill is about preventing chaos in Washington. It's about upholding, um, it's about complying to the Washington Voting Rights Act decision last June. So we are really in a good position to speak to a wide swath of political. Um, yeah, and I think strikes. Representative Ferguson kind of made a point without um, it is they are incredibly busy and stressed out right now. So. <laughs> Remember that they are people. There are times to fight the man. There are times to protest. There are all those times. This is not that time. Yeah. This is a time to try to find connection, to have some empathy for the legislature and, and the legislators and what they're going through and all the bills they're dealing with and the budget and transportation budget and the capital budget. And they're, they've got 60 days to get all that done. I, I just want to make, the, you know, like just have people imagine trying to do that in 60 days. I mean, we should probably move to a full-time legislature, right? Um, so try to have it be a positive meeting, even if they disagree, um, because you don't want to be the difficult people that came into their office that, you know, were telling them that they're bad people and they don't know what they're doing. And that's not the tone that you should have in these meetings. No, because like she mentioned, that's what that's what they'll remember, right? They'll remember. That's what they'll remember. Yeah. And they'll be like, I don't want to deal with that. I understand. I mean, the, one of the challenge with elected officials in this democracy reform space is they got elected under one set of rules that, you know, they played checkers and you're like, well, what about chess? You know, let's try that for a while. And they're like, I get checkers. I don't get chess. So I'm just, you know, and if you're adding to that, like you're stupid because you don't understand chess. If you're adding to that sense of like, they're just bad feelings about the whole thing in this space especially i think that can go incredibly badly absolutely absolutely thank you for touching on all of that yeah sure all right um john how do legislators decide if they're going to support a bill i think we already got into that a little bit but i'd love to touch on it again um because we talked about values we talked a little bit about um the whole ecosystem of politics but how does that all factor in when? Yeah. And, and I do think one of the things that happens is there are committees that all these bills go to in the House. This will go to the state government committee. Representative Gregerson is one of the people on that committee. There will be some deference to the state government committee if you're talking to somebody who's not on that committee or deference to leadership like the Speaker of the House or House Majority Leader and where they stand. Um, that's OK. You don't need to know where all those people stand, but you should be OK with that def with that deference. That's just the way that it works. But that, you know, one, they're going to come from their own values. I mean, there are a bunch of people in this legislature that are just going to be super excited about this bill from the get go. There'll be a bunch of people that just have not been tracking democracy reform. They work on transportation or and the millions of issues that are going on in Olympia. Um, so be respectful of that deference. That's the way the process works. Um, you know, so that's another piece of it, I think, that you got to kind of think through. I am muted. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank okay. you. All right. Are you ready to move into some questions from the audience? Sure. All right. Well, keep them coming, folks. We have time for a few more. 
Um, but John Morgan would like to know how partisan or bipartisan is ranked choice voting in the Washington legislature? And do we know of Democrats oppose or Republicans who support? There are Republicans that support. Let me start with the Republican side. Um, there are Republicans that support. There was the whole issue in Alaska with Sarah Palin um, that frustrated some Republicans. So just so you know that that's out there. But there are a bunch of Republicans that our lobbyists have talked to and political director and folks that are supportive of this bill. So it's definitely not. Um, I would say it's a little harder on the Republican side um, because of what happened in Alaska. Um, on the Democratic side, there are some people, there are a lot of supporters. Um, you know, there's a ton of Democratic uh sponsors on the bill. Uh, there are some people that I wouldn't say that they are opposed to it necessarily, but they have a lot of questions. And that's why it's really important for us to do this lobby day and to keep our, our messages really straightforward um, to go back to, you know, sort of we're working to improve democracy. We're working to make sure there's some guidelines on this bill or on this process so that, um, you know, these cities and counties aren't just on their own. Um, that's probably the... Uh, the hill we got to climb is um, to get some Republicans on the bill. You know, we don't want it to be a partisan bill, that's for sure. And to get uh, more Democrats who just are still learning what this bill does. I mean, we just dropped this bill two days ago. So, you know, people are going to have some questions. So you can be really the instruments of of helping to address and answer those questions with some deference to the, they've got a lot of things going on and there's the process for the bill to move through and they're somewhere in that stream, but they may not be in the early part. So they'll be explaining all that to you. That's fine. You know, um, you know, but this will all move the messaging forward uh, so that when we hit these decision points, we can, we can jump through all these hoops to the governor's desk. Absolutely. Let's get it done. I'm excited about it. All right. So Jeff Jordan would like to know, is it helpful to point out that another person representing in the same district is sponsoring a bill um, and that it might need help in the opposite chamber uh, when uh, you're having these meetings? Yeah, I mean, it's always helpful to have as much context as possible to go back to what Representative Gregerson was saying about their own personal values. I mean, even, you know, in my district, these the three legislators, you know, they have similar values, but they're not always on the same page on stuff. So it, it, it would be useful to say, you know, your your other colleagues in your district are supporting this, but I wouldn't lean on it too heavily. I would go back to just the, the benefits of this bill and why it's important. And, you know, again, to just keep that messaging really straightforward and simple. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh we're getting some really great questions in here. Thanks for this is great. Thanks Thank for answering you. all these. Yeah. All right. Um, our uh, attendee Luis wants to know what stands out most for legislators when you contact them. Um, email, phone calls, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Oh yeah. Um, I, you know, I think they they answer everything as much as they can. I would guess that a phone call would be the best. I'm a phone call guy because I'm old. Um, but, you know, I just think the direct communication, that direct conversation, but a very well written email could do that. It would could, you know, make a really big difference, too. But I'd, I'd maybe if I was picking, I'd go phone call first. I would agree. I, when I and maybe you have a little more insight into this. When an office of a legislator receives an email, is there sometimes a bit of a lag as they sort through all the emails? Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think it varies by office. And, you know, we all hear this, this legislator is really good at constituent service. This one, not so much. So it does vary. Um, so, uh, but yeah, get the calls and letters in and volume matters. I mean, just getting a lot of calls and letters in can make, I mean, I've seen a number of times where legislators were de deluged with contacts and it made a difference in the bill. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I remember from my days working in a constituent office setting, um, those phone calls were just instant. You know, we knew immediately what the issue was and we could yep. immediately tell the legislator, you know, this is where your constituents are today. So yep. I also trend towards phone calls, but you know, maybe it's because I've worked with a lot of old people like you. I'm just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. So, so to wrap it up, folks, phone calls are the most efficient, but emails are just as good. All right. Uh, we have a question from Emily Bass. Um, this is a bit of a hard one, John. Um, why has the bill not passed previously? And what is different about the bill this legislative session? Well, you know, ranked choice voting across the country is kind of has, you know, in many places around the world, as we know, it's it's used all the time. It, you know, it's there's nothing completely revolutionary about ranked choice voting. It is used all the time. But in the United States, we've had a, you know, a primary and then we have a general and, you know, so in the last probably five or six years, this ranked choice voting movement has been building. Right. And um, uh I, I think a lot of it was a learning curve for legislators uh, over the last few years. It was also a much broader bill around local options. So it was a little bit of a different policy than what we're looking at now. The great thing that happened and part of the reason that this bill is so interesting and so possible this year is because the, the Supreme Court has said that you, you know cities and counties in local jurisdictions, I'm probably missing some, can use ranked choice voting, right, as a remedy for the Voting Rights Act. Though, you know, we if folks have been watching in Yakima, uh, they moved to districts. There's a number of places that have moved to districts as a remedy, but now we can use ranked choice voting. The problem is there are there are you know a handful of ways to do ranked choice voting. It would be up to the city and county to decide how to do that. They are kind of you know, making a cake without a recipe in a sense, if they just do it on their own, we want to give them a recipe. You know, there's a lot of um, qualified people in the secretary of state's office, uh, in auditor's offices around the country that can help craft a way so that if somebody uses ranked choice voting uh, for the first time, it can be as successful as possible. So we believe that we we don't want to create legal complications, you know, down the line by not addressing this issue. We want ranked choice voting, obviously, folks in this room to be successful. So we we believe this bill, because you don't have to necessarily be a fan of uh, ranked choice voting, but you should be a fan of elections going smoothly, that that this bill has a, a, a good probability to pass, um, given the way that you know, we've, you know, folks have constructed this thing, right? So, so it is a little different. So, but I also think it gives us a, a new opportunity and, and probably some new uh, legislators who were a little reticent before with the way that this is um, tailored because of the Supreme Court to, uh, to get it passed this year. I have this desire to compare this bill to a box of Ghirardelli brownie mix. You know, like we don't want you just to go to the store and hope for the best that you can find what you need. Let's give you the best option possible <laughs> and let's give it to everyone. Yeah. Um, I'd also love to bring in our legislative director, Stephanie Houghton, to support answering this question. I That'd think John, you nailed a lot of it. And... I could use the help. <laughs> no, you nailed it. You nailed it. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, my name is Stephanie Houghton. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the legislative director for Fair Vote Washington. Um, and yes, yes to everything John said. The bill is different this time for a lot of reasons, um, but I'm I'm looking at this bill as it's now, now we have an opportunity to get, to work with so many other people, so many groups that have been hesitant or have had questions. And now this time, because we're now, like we do not want a chaotic elections process a lot of people don't want a chaotic elections process. So like come be on our team is a different message than can we please try this thing? <laughs> um, and that's, you know, been a lot of, like I've been working on this for a few years. The one piece that I just also want to land on is I've lived in Washington now for three years. I've lived in Pierce County. I live in Tacoma. I'm not in Tacoma right now, but I live in Tacoma. And I hear a lot about Pierce County's experience with ranked choice voting. And this bill is not a direct response to Pierce County. It is an opportunity though for us to learn from Pierce County and to say, hey, that thing didn't work. This piece didn't work. That part didn't go well. How can we make it better? And uh, so that even has allowed us to have conversations with officials in Pierce County to say, how can we work on this together? Which 
I have to say in my three years has not really been on the table. Um, so specifically the folks in, uh, in Pierce County, we now get to go have this conversation with them, which is like, just, it's just incredible. It's just amazing. And the same is true for a lot of our, you know, um, more conservative friends and colleagues is like, it's still, you know, we're not, this is in no way, you know, setting up a requirement that you're all going to have to just start like changing the way this, this is now something that we can all work on together to prevent chaos. Because as John said, I don't think there are a lot of people looking around elections and looking around our government and saying, yeah, 10 out of 10, no notes, looks good from here. Um, so this this isn't this really is a bill of, about building our coalition to be even bigger. Thank you so much. I am excited to see this bill pass this year. Um, we have a really top-notch team and a top-notch bill and some top-notch reasons to pass it. And I will stop saying top-notch now. All right. Um, a lot of the rest of our questions are sort of directed back towards the experience of having a meeting with a legislator, which I'm really excited, excited about. Um, we have some questions about um, how much time should we spend talking about ranked choice voting if we're talking about this bill? And I think that would be a great one to start with right now, um, considering we just spent a lot of time saying this bill isn't really about ranked choice voting. Um, I'll start with you, John, and then go to Stephanie. I mean, I would. I think it's fine to talk about ranked choice voting in in terms of the bill. I mean, I, you know, I, I think you should talk about the bill. And the questions for about ranked choice voting are probably going to come up, right? And, and uh, so answering those questions would be good. But I, I don't, because we are working on getting some legislators that have either not been involved in this process, may have maybe new to the legislature in the last couple of years, or have been somewhat reticent, or maybe not involved because it 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 didn't get to them um, that you know, explain the bill would be the first step. They they may have questions about ranked choice voting, and I would answer those questions to the, to the best of your ability. And it is totally fine, by the way. I think lobbyists do this all the time, where it's like, I don't know the answer to that, but I will get that answer and get back to you. Uh, that is a fine thing to do. You are not expected to master uh, electoral history of the United States and, you know, or around the country, or around the world. Um, so do the best you can to answer the question. But if you don't know, just say, you know, uh, I'm still learning about some of this too. I will get back. I will have our, uh, our lobbyist or, or one of the staff or one of the coalition members get back to you. Perfect. Love that. Um, we actually have a follow-up question that's going to talk really well into that, but Stephanie, I want to hear your thoughts first. <laughs> oh, no, John, I got there. The, 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 uh, the phrase, I don't know, I'll get back to you, key phrase when talking to a legislator, when talking to a fellow voter, when talking to anyone, really, really important. It's actually... I Oh, go ahead. Work a lot on ranked choice voting. I talk a lot about ranked choice voting. I have not memorized every single sort of like particular thing about ranked choice voting. The part that matters is the part about why you care about ranked choice voting. Some of our meetings, by the way, on lobby day are wicked early in the morning. They're like 8 30, 9 a.m. meetings. Why would you get up that early to go talk about ranked choice voting? Well, only you can answer that question. I know my answer. I know why I'm going to get up wicked early to go uh, talk, to go talk to a legislator, um, but that's something that you have in in your head, and that's that's the part, like Rep. Gregerson was saying, like Jonathan saying, that's going to stick with the legislators, and also is the one that they're going to turn around and tell their colleagues. They're they're not necessarily going to be like, this is what ranked choice voting is, and they're not. That's that is part of it, but it's also like I talked to one of my constituents today. I am eager to tell you about that experience. So that's also, that's important. Carrie, I feel like yeah. I'm oh, I'm sorry. No, no, oh, I was gonna make a joke, but this was much better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> um, that said, um, because obviously our, our personal experiences, I like to frame it as you are more of an expert on yourself and your experiences than you are on this bill, and it should be that way. Um, but 
Is there a, do we have a favorite elevator description of ranked choice voting for any legislators who might not be familiar with it or who might need that bit of education? Um, Stephanie, I'll start with you. Sure, okay. My quick, you want me to give the pitch on ranked choice voting, not the pitch on law voices, just to be Correct, yes. Yeah. Right. Pitch yeah. on ranked choice voting. So um, ranked choice voting is a simple upgrade to the way that we do elections now, instead of uh, only selecting one candidate, you get to rank your candidates one, two, three. And that's it, because then they have to get out of the elevator and they don't get to ask me any more questions. <laughs> this was a ride up two floors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I wanted to oh, no. be very clear. We're not riding a very long elevator right here. This is a quick, <laughs> we're snapping through. But I have found that if you stop at explaining how someone fills out a ballot, that's actually really effective. And that's that they start thinking about that. And then if you give them another minute, then you can go back and sort of start talking about how you go from the person who comes in last, all of those second choice votes get redistributed until someone reaches 50%. Absolutely. John, do you have a different elevator pitch or is it the same? No, I, I think you start there. And, and I'm sort of thinking about this out loud a little bit, so I'm going to do the best. But I think you start there, but then as as quickly as you can, I think you get to the values, you know, that um, we what we find with ranked choice voting is more people feel included. There's less negative campaigning, which is also, I think, with elected officials, something that should pique their interest. Have, having gone through a few elections, they probably would like that idea. Um, so I, I think that if you, you're you expanding the table, pe people feel more included and there's less negative campaigning and more focus on policy, those are going to be things that um, elected officials are going to be excited about. So if you can sneak that in there too. That to me sounds a little bit like the chocolate pack that comes in those Ghirardelli brownie mixes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what that sounds like to me. Um, we are right about at time for our questions. Thank you both so much. Um, as a fun transfer, I'd love to bring in our political director to answer a question. Um, Nilu, welcome to the screen. <laughs> um, what does our coalition look like for this bill? Well, it's pretty exciting. I think we have a graphic that we can show. Um, like it's asking me to unmute myself. I'm pretty sure I'm unmuted, right? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> um, can you all see the graphic? It's a really great um, coalition that we got going on. I'm super excited about it. There's still people adding to it, talking to their boards in their meetings that they're having. If there are orgs that you're a part of that you think would be interested, um, have them reach out to me or any of us. We would love to expand this coalition. Really, the goal is to avoid electoral chaos that's landing very well. And um, really the com education component of it is of it too. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw out there is that one of our members, uh, Sightline Institute, has written a great article that we are going to include, maybe put in the chat, I think now, and it has some really great takeaways that speak to that electoral chaos, reasons why people may want to support that this bill. I've actually sent it and gotten some more coalition supporters as a result because it really is it just makes sense. Why would you want electoral chaos? And I'm going to hand it back to Carrie, who's going to speak to about how you might write your legislators. And I think for all you, those takeaways may be an easy way for you to summarize some of your reasons, including the personal reasons that we've touched upon a few times, because that can be really impactful. It's, and I really want to encourage you all as you reach out to the legislators, send individual things. We don't we don't want to do form letters. Your individual call, your email is the best way. And we are happy to help with those tools. And I really think this article is helpful for those of you who might be struggling. Well, thank you. It's good to see you all, or pretend I see you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Nilu. Um, and thank you, John Weibel. I'm going to kick you off the screen before I keep going, but I'm just going to small round of applause. Please imagine it thundering from our audience of 65 people. Um, thank you so much for being here today and um, and well, every thank day. Thank everybody for, for doing this work. It's really important. I'm just going to give a, two things. I'm going to give two things. One, really quickly, 
Um, I didn't actually talk about why can why ranked choice voting makes campaigning nicer to people because you want to be someone's second choice, not just their first choice. So if I'm running against Nilu, um, I'm not gonna. I know, I know. I'm not gonna like come in really hard on Nilu though because Nilu's number one voters might rank me second if I don't. And so I'll just talk about policy differences that Nilu and I have, and then perhaps her voters will say, "Yeah, Steph can have um, my second choice." Um, but if I attack Nilu, her voters are not going to do that. Um, and we see that in states like um, Iowa during the presidential primary that kind of have like a version of this where like candidates have to be a little nicer to each other in Iowa than they do have to be in other places. So that's a really quick con context. I only shared that part of my personal story, but yeah. Um, really quick, because I know we're coming up on the end of this meeting. Uh, we have two identical bills. One is in the House, one is in the Senate. The House bill number, as has been shared, I think a couple of times, it's House Bill HB 2250. And the prime sponsor of that is Representative Gregerson, who you saw earlier tonight. Um, but there are a total of 22 sponsors on that bill, which is fantastic. That is a great number. Um, and then also recently dropped was our Senate bill, by uh, Senator Nobles, um, and that is Senate Bill, so SB 6156. There are eight sponsors on that, which is similarly an excellent number coming out of the Senate, so feeling really good about that. Now, here's a little bit of inside baseball for you. We're hoping to get this through the House, so we're going to work really hard to get this through the House. Right now, it's in the State Government and Tribal Relations Committee. That's where it was sent. It needs to be voted out of that committee by January 31st. Chairman um, Ramos uh, is the one who, uh, he's the chairman of that committee. Um, so he is gonna, he's someone that we're working with to try to get a hearing so that we can get voted out of the that committee um, again by January 31st. Uh, so that's where the House bill is right now. The Senate bill is in the State Government and Elections Committee. That's chaired by Senator Hunt. Like I said, we have a House strategy. We got to pick one. Um, and for us, uh, the House the House just seemed like a little bit of a clearer path to us. You might be wondering, why do you even have one in the Senate then? Senators are short on time. All the representatives are short on time. They're not going to meet with us if there's not a Senate bill, essentially, which I completely understand. I do not blame them for this, but it's good for us to be able to set up those meetings in the set on the Senate side to prepare to for us to be prepared to go through the Senate and for the senators to be prepared to receive our bill in the most efficient and effective way. So again, that's like a little bit of inside baseball. The numbers that matter are House Bill twenty two fifty and Senate Bill sixty one fifty six. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the legislative update as I see it. Uh, Mila, do you want to jump in? I don't have anything to add. I was going to talk about the coalition. I've done. Mine. Yes. Oh, please do. Great. <laughs> no, I already did it. We already shared already, it. Oh, you already did the coalition. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. So oh, we're good. We have so many. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at then. That's the legislative update. All right. I really appreciate you both. And um, I'm going to send it over to Carrie to send us off. Thank you all. I'm going to bring up Carrie. If fate is with me. There we go. Go for it, Carrie. Awesome. Well, I just won't share my screen. Um, but I want to close out by thanking you all for joining us tonight. Uh, obviously, a lot of this roadmap is in preparation for our lobby day, which is happening next Wednesday, January 17th in Olympia. We have a really great program lined up for you for the entire day, um, starting at 9 a.m. with a kickoff um, from one of our board members and former Alaska State Representative Jason Gren. Um, we have meetings across every LD that has somebody signed up for them courtesy of our incredible operations manager, Nicole, um, and a great rally where you'll get to hear from Mia Gregerson again. So I really hope that you will join us if you're not already signed up, if you're not amongst the 100 plus people who have signed up to join us, um, I hope you consider doing that. 
uh, there will be no screen sharing on lobby day because it is in person. So there can be no technological errors. So I can promise you that. I can't promise a lot else. It'll be fun. There will be coffee <laughs> and there will be no Zoom. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope to see you next week. And if you aren't able to join us then, um, keep an eye out for our action alerts that will be coming through um, in the next several weeks as we get through this very quick 60 day session, trying to move this bill all the way to the governor's desk with a pen in hand. So thank you so much.